Welcome to the Freshman Foundation Podcast, helping you make the jump from high school athletics to the collegiate level and beyond with your host, Michael Hebert. Who is Avery Dobsek and why is she a role model to student athletes? Many young people look up to college and professional athletes strictly because of their performance. However, they often know very little about the person behind the performer. My guest on this episode, Avery Dobsek, is a Division I golfer at Hofstra University. Perhaps more importantly, she is a flat-out hustler. Avery is a journalist, content creator, and entrepreneur, all while tackling the rigors of being a Division I student-athlete. In episode 24, Avery talks about her drive to be successful in everything she does. She also talks about her laser focus on life after golf. Avery is a role model to young athletes because she starts with the end in mind. Avery has a clear plan for life after sport and started executing that plan the day she stepped onto campus at Hofstra. I'm excited for this conversation. Let's build your foundation with Avery Dobsek. Hey, Avery, how's it going? It's going good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for coming on here tonight. Talk to me. Uh, for those of uh, those on, in the audience who are listening, uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So my name is Avery Dovsik. I'm originally from Southern California, and I currently reside in Long Island, New York, um, which I'm bouncing all over the place right now, but home base is Long Island at the moment. Um, I am a senior at Hofstra University. Uh, which is a Division One golf school, and I was recruited out of high school to play Division One golf here. Why I left sunny California to play in the cold, I still don't know, but it's been a great experience, and I have now transitioned into a golf media career, um, which I'm sure we'll get into. Excellent. So how did you start playing golf? I picked up a club when I was five, but I don't really count that. I played volleyball for a lot of years. I'm really tall. And around 13, 14, my dad said, oh, you should play golf. And I was like, no, absolutely not. Um, So he kind of forced me into the sport uh, really against my will. I hated it. I hated practicing. I hated everything about it twice a day, every day. Um, And then I started liking it once I got good. (laughs) I made varsity my freshman year and went on to be team captain, MVP, Um, you know, just starting to look at schools and I'm the first to go to college in my family, um, in my immediate family at least. And, you know, it's gotten me a scholarship to a really great university. And I have my father and my mom to thank for that because if I had stuck with volleyball, I'm not over six feet tall. I'm very tall, but the chance of me going to a D one school were not as high as they are with golf. That was going to be my next question. How tall are you? Five foot 10. <laughs> Five foot 10. Okay. Yep. <laughs> So you were forced into playing golf, which that is not the answer I was expecting you to give, right? I was expecting you to give the, I started when I was five, it was supernatural and I loved it and I have been, nope. Nope. And, <laughs> and so it's, it's really interesting, right? Because you didn't like it at first because you weren't good at it, which is like, so sports psychology, I won't get into that. But the fact that you were able to make that leap and that much development in that short of time just seems to speak to your athleticism. Yeah, I'm pretty good athlete. Um, in my free time, I train for bodybuilding. So I'm actually uh, looking to compete in a show this summer. It was supposed to be during the pandemic, but all of them got canceled on me. So I took a long needed break away from dieting, living my life right now, and then I'll get back into it in a few months. But um, yeah, I'm pretty athletic. The only sport that I really suck at is soccer. Uh, but besides that, it's, it's not too bad. <laughs> Nice. So bodybuilding. So the level of commitment and dedication to bodybuilding, I, as you know better than I do, I've known some bodybuilders is is really, really significant, even if you're doing it at an amateur level. So how do you play division one golf at a university and travel and do the things that you're doing and still train to compete in a bodybuilding competition? Yeah. Bodybuilding is out of everything I do. Bodybuilding is the most mentally tough thing I've ever put myself through. Um, being 21 and I started when I was 20, like I'd always worked out, but I went from working out to training and there's a very big Mm -hmm. difference there. Um, 
and weighing your food is very meticulous and controlling every variable of what you put in your body is very meticulous and getting asked, Hey, Avery, do you want to go out for drinks? And you being like, no, can't, I have to weigh my food and sit home. Uh, you don't have to sit home. You can go out, but it's a very mental thing. Mm -hmm. Um, the training is the easy part for me. Ask me to do the cardio, ask me to lift, pull heavy weights. That's not a problem, Mm -hmm. but the food, having social events, having travel team dinners, um, that's the hardest part, <laughs> but it's definitely something, an outlet for me. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people go to therapy, whatever. That is my therapy. A lot of my stress gets out there. It's my time, put my headphones in and don't want to be bothered <laughs> unless I'm training a teammate, which happens quite often right now. But yeah. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I've gone through phases like that in my life where I was actually weighing my food as well and it only lasts for so long. So to be able to do it in a sustained basis in preparation for a competition probably is the only way you can do it, right? When you know there's like a goal in sight and you have to show up on stage and yeah. you know people are going to be judging you. That, <laughs> that, that'll, that'll keep you home at night. <laughs> that's difficult right now. I mean, I went through a dieting phase of eight months. It was supposed to be only 16 weeks of off and on dieting because shows kept getting canceled. So I was really lean at one point and my blood results just got all wonky at the end. And I was like, well, no, we have to pull back. I need to take some time off, eat, get my hormone levels in check, get everything back before I can do this again. Because I -hmm. mean, I've now been weighing my food and tracking macronutrients for two years. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just so easy for me. I don't even think about it, (laughs) but for a lot of people, it's very tough. Um, But even in this improvement, they call it an improvement season, not an off season. Um, I still really do see the bigger picture. So I don't have an issue weighing that and getting into all that. Yeah. It's become a habit, right? One that's basically automatic. You do it and you don't even think twice about it, which it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing to have for the rest of your life. You may not always do this, but you'll always have it to go back to where a lot of people never even get to that point. So that's, that's really cool. And I guess I'm curious and I, I I always get sidetracked because I'm so interested in what you're saying. So how does the bodybuilding impact your golf performance and how does it, I imagine it conflicts at some level. Yeah. So I learned you cannot play a solid round of 18 holes on 1300 calories. Uh, I learned that really hard, (laughs) especially walking. So there is some, some struggles, but it does help for the bigger part of it. Um, I say mentally, I've never been as mentally strong as I am now since I started bodybuilding. Um, it's a different kind of struggle. Um, yes, I've gone through a lot of life events that have put me through hardship, struggle, whatever. It may look glamorous from the outside, but there's a lot that goes on, but that's just a whole different thing because you're in charge of every variable. If you mess up, it's on you. Like golf, you have bad bounces, right? Like you can't control everything, but you can control pretty much every variable in bodybuilding, which is a great thing. And it can be a really struggling thing. And you learn a lot about yourself on how to keep yourself accountable and how to have Mm -hmm. discipline. But it's helped a lot in that respect. I've obviously picked up quite a bit of distance on the tee. Um, it's some days I'll be more fatigued than I probably should be and have to play golf. Um, I just kind of learned to roll with it. Um, yeah, mostly is like, you just have to, if you're dieting and you're trying to play competitive golf, it's just not going to work because Mm -hmm. carbs are your energy. And when you have no energy, you don't play good golf. (laughs) (laughs) Makes sense. Right. Especially if you're walking for however my five miles, you know, with a bag on your back or whatever. Right. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah. last question and then I'm going to move on, but how much distance have you picked up off the tee because of the bodybuilding? Probably 50 to 60 yards. Wow. That's a yeah, lot. Yeah. I went from like, I went from like 220 to like 280, 300 with some clubs. And how does that compare to some of your your uh, competitors and teammates, contemporaries, in terms of driving? That you're like blowing them out of the water. Yeah, yeah. You also have the height, which gives you the lever, and then you add the strength and the the power behind it. Then you're like you're like a machine. Yeah, damn. If I could putt, I'd go pro. <laughs> <laughs> well, now talk about talk about having mental strength. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, so, so you started 13, 14, you weren't into it, but you started to get good. And that's when your outlook changed. But at what point did you realize that, Hey, maybe there was a future in golf beyond high school? 
that was honestly the only way I was going to college. Um, mm-hmm. Financially, we didn't plan well, and we lived in a very financially um, stable area, and rent's expensive in California. Um, we lived really close to the water, which I'm very grateful for, but, you know, it did put us at times of a stretch. Um mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was the main thing. It was like, okay, you kind of have to be good at this if you want to go to school, Uh, which is not typical, not the typical story. But I think that really fueled my fire um, and gave me a bigger goal to shoot for. Um, The difficult part was since I was the only person to attend college in my immediate family, I had zero help. So my parents had no clue that I was emailing coaches, talking to coaches. They literally did not know. They did not understand. When I committed, they didn't think it was a big deal. They were like, oh, cool. Like, and... Meanwhile, my other friends were getting parties and all this stuff. And not to say that I was envious or something. It's just my parents didn't understand the volume that it speaks to sign that kind of contract. Yeah. How did you, like, how did you figure out to, how to navigate the system? Honestly, I've always been like a go-getter. I got my first job at the age of 14. I had my first internship at 17. Um, and I kind of just went on a limb. I really had no help. Um, I didn't hire anyone to help me through the process. Mm -hmm. I just started emailing and I started putting together really bad videos that make me literally cringe. I am also pretty much self-taught at the sport with the help of my father who isn't very good at golf. (laughs) Sorry. Um, so (laughs) it's, it was hard. Like I didn't know what they were looking for. I didn't even know like what angles to take videos from like down the line or in front um, or what even a proper recruitment video looks like. But now, I mean, it's the industry in that respect for golf has grown tremendously. Okay. So when you were going through that, obviously it was, it was sort of self-managed, self-taught as well, um, which is, seems to be a theme. Um, Like how did you, like, what were your, did you have criteria for where you'd go or was it just, Hey, I, I need to get a D one offer. I can get the, the most amount of money or like, what were you looking at? Money was a big factor Sure. to, uh, originally I remember looking at local schools and then I was like, nah, let's go big or go home. So we went big and we moved to the farthest I could away from home. Um, sure. besides leaving the country. So I ended up 25 minutes away from the heart of New York city, which was great from a career standpoint. Uh, I entered college as a television and business major, which at the time sounded great. And it sounded like I could encompass a bunch of things and I wasn't stuck to just being a journalist or just being blah, blah, blah. But as I got more work, which I'm sure we'll get into, I really shifted my focus in what I wanted to study. But having the city right there Mm -hmm. at my fingertips has been awesome. Uh, I couldn't have asked for a better location. Yeah. I grew up on Long Island right near Hofstra. And so it is a great location. Um, it's, it's almost like I used to like wonder how did I get so lucky to grow up in the, in the New York area? Right. You know, people say, where are you from? And you say, Oh, from New York. And they're like, really? Wow. Like what's that like? And you know, we can have a whole conversation about what it's like to live on Long Island, but you know, (laughs) it's not the, but in the fact that you took that leap is really, is really amazing. You know, and I, and I went away from home myself. I didn't know where I was going. My parents didn't go to college where we have a lot of, a lot of things in common. And I showed up in Michigan and I didn't know one person and I I barely had a dime in my pocket and it's like, well, go figure it out, you know? Um, So I I get that. And there's a lot, there's a lot, you know, to be said for that. And it's also makes you feel good about yourself that you're able to, to do those things on your own. Now, ultimately you were sending out crappy videos um, you were self-taught. You had only been playing for four or five years. Why did, did, what, what did Hofstra see in you as a golfer that made them say, we want to have this, this person? Um, I had some good rounds under my belt. Uh, I performed well at some tournaments, uh, at the state level. I performed well. Um, I think what they really saw though, is like an athletic build and a potential for an even better golf swing. Because in these videos, like you see, I was powerful, Um, and maybe the, like, you know, twitching was slight, um, to become from good to great. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was really fortunate that the first coach who is no longer with us, um, John Jordan, uh, he took a, you know, gamble on me and we met in person and we clicked very well. He seemed very family oriented, um, 
we just conversation flowed. I mean, when you're recruiting an athlete, you're recruiting the athlete, but you're also recruiting the person because mm. you have a lot of van rides. You have a lot of, you know, overnight stays, a lot of travel. And that's something a lot of people don't think about is yes, your scores matter, how you play matters, but how you are and how you act as a person also matters because if you don't jive as a team, you're not going to play well. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, so it sounds like the, the coach who recruited you and you had that relationship with, there was a coaching change at some point. Mm-hmm. And, and what was that like? Um, it was interesting because we are, my first coach was a golf professional, very educated in the sport. I really respected his advice and I really liked him. My teammates didn't really, weren't really in favor of him. So However, that unfolded is is what it is. So we got a new coach who I really like as a person. And he is a very, I find him kind of like a friend. His golf abilities aren't as strong as the first coach, um, which sometimes since I am self-taught, I went to college thinking that I would be able to kind of get a swing coach under my belt. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, that's kind of rough sometimes, but I can't complain. I mean, he, I've been given great opportunities, played great courses. Um, I've grew a lot as a person and a player. So it's been nice. I appreciate the honesty. It's not, not probably not the easiest question to answer, especially since you're still there. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so, so you decide to go to Hofstra and then this is sort of the meat and potatoes of, of what this podcast is about, right? You pick up, you pack your bags, you get your clubs and you move to Hempstead. Long Island, Uniondale, wherever, right? You know, the middle of Long Island, rock on big time. Yeah. Um, and what was it like? So what was that transition like when you get onto campus and it doesn't just have to be golf, culturally, the people, like what was it like that first year you were in college? I always say to people, like, I'm pretty sure you could throw me in a paper bag and I'd be okay. Um, <laughs> so I got here and s- end of August, like October or August, like 28th or something. Um, I walked into a group of friends being on the team and we clicked very well. Uh, in October, a month, and no, I'm sorry. First few weeks, I started teaching cycling classes at the university. Um, and then I got a job at a cycle studio, like a one, a, a boutique one that I actually still will work at here and there. I'm a manager at now. Um, and that had also gave me another group of friends cause it was a bunch of girls my age and it made that transition absolutely seamless. Um, Hofstra is great in the respect that you have like 12, 16 students in some of your classes if you're in media. So I was really close to my professors. Um, it is a bit different though in college compared to high school is nobody really talks in class. Like I remember in high school, I knew everybody's name. I had their numbers. Like we hung out outside of class and here it is mm-hmm. not the same. Yeah. Um, and I think that stems from most of Hofstra students being commuters. So they come in, study, go home. They have their hometown friends, which is fine. Um, so the athletes definitely tend to flock together. I definitely got very close with all my professors. I've had one professor five times now. Um, so it's been good in that respect. Definitely some differences. I think East Coast people are very nice and friendly, though. People talk in elevators, something I'm not used to. Um, yeah, I mean, my transition – for me, at least, was very easy. I did not get homesick. <laughs> I was so concerned about what was going. And the first week, I remember, <laughs> we had a practice, a team practice, and it was to see who was going to play in the tournament that weekend. And mm-hmm. I remember Taylor made called me and was like, hey, do you want to do a commercial? And I was like, I didn't know the rules at that time. So I asked my coach, like, hey, can I miss the qualifying round to do the commercial? And one, he was like, uh, no, you can't miss the round. In two, you're not allowed to do that. So then I started learning the hard rules of the NCAA. Um, and then as my career unfolded, that's been something to be very mindful about. Mm. That's interesting. So it was a compliance issue. Lots of compliance issues. All yeah. The, I, I, the more I learn about it, the more I, I realize that it's like a hornet's nest. And I've gotten to know some people in compliance and I'm starting to spend more time within uni- university athletic departments and realize what a, what a, what a headache yeah, it is. I'll for- share a story later on when we get into something. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, so now when you picked Hofstra, like was the media department, the major a consideration or was it, hey, they have it, I'm going to go, and I don't really understand sort of the strength of the, the department? Well, when I toured, I remembered I was interested in nursing. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I don't know what I was thinking. 
that was a cute idea. Um, I saw a machine that could birth a baby and I freaked out. So um, that was a no go. But then I walked to the communications building and I saw the cameras and I saw the rooms. I saw mm-hmm. the, the light boards. I saw, you know, really what media was. Um, mm-hmm. I grew up doing musicals and I always liked to perform. My aunt was a newscaster, which always interested me. Um, so that's why I started thinking like, wow, this is, you know, really interesting to me. So you started with TV and business. So, so what happened? Um, so in 2019, I was looking for internships as a freshman, like a weirdo. Um, and I started applying to different places and I saw the golf channel had an internship. So I like, didn't tell anyone I applied or anything, but I thought, you know, worst case it's practice with the resume and a cover letter. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting the internship. So I moved down to Orlando for the summer when I was 19 years old, definitely being the youngest person in the building and worked on their morning show, morning drive. My shift started every day at 3am, sometimes 2.30. And I was about by, I was out by 10 or 11am. With that, I saw everything, every part of TV, production, post-production, editing, you know, all the ins and outs. And I really loved what the broadcasters did and the talent did. So that really clarified to me and told me exactly what I want to do, which is why I encourage everyone to get internships, because if I didn't do that, I would have been stuck in something I had no clue um, what would tell for me. So I ended up switching to journalism and I picked up a second major of rhetorical studies and public advocacy. So I will be a double major. And um, yeah, that's it was kind of the turning point. And I'm very glad I learned that early on because I did not mess up any credits. I didn't mess up. I didn't get behind. I actually still had the chance to add another major. Um, so that's how that unfolded. That's awesome. That's good. And that's great advice, right? Because I've been in that boat too. I mean, getting internships and actually doing the work is going to really clue you into whether or not you want to do something for the rest of your life. Um, So I have to ask this question too, before I get back to asking you about your first year at Hofstra, what do you do? Do you have any free time for like enjoyment? Like I, I I don't understand. Like, is it possible to socialize? Because you do a lot of things. Uh, yes, it is. I definitely okay. do socialize, and it's been busy, but it's filled with work I absolutely love. Like, it doesn't even feel like work. So, um, a little more career stuff. I went from the Golf Channel um, to CBS Sports um, to Sirius XM to Golf Week USA Today. And I believe that's where we're at now. I may be missing. Oh, and scratch with the PGA tour. So a lot of different avenues of work and each company has been great. I have zero complaints with anyone. Uh, And it's really kind of navigated on where I want to spend a lot of my time. So right now I am freelancing for golf week and I do a lot of other freelance work. So I'll do right. I'll do content creation um, videos, or with Scratch by the PGA Tour, we filmed a series this summer where we traveled to different states, played 72 holes of golf in 72 hours, and filmed it where to eat, stay, the whole nine yards. So, um, yes, I do have time for free time, <laughs> but these projects are a hell of a lot better to me than school right now. Um, I obviously encourage school, but I'll be honest right now, my day at school is me working <laughs> while I'm yeah, doing, while I'm in class. <laughs> Yeah. But I I think you said something really important that I can also relate to is that when you do something that you love, it really does not feel like work. Right. And, and I had a career before what I do now in sports psychology and it felt like work every single day. And now for the last, you know, four, four years of my life, it feels like every day I wake up, even when I wasn't getting paid for my internships for two years, like I was so happy. And so it's definitely like for anyone who's listening, it's like, Find something you love to do and you can find a way to make money doing it. Yeah. No, I just turned down a job offer, a full-time job offer like a week ago. And I thought long and hard about it because it was very good money, um, substantially more money than I'm making right now. And it was in a social media space, but it wasn't really content creation. It was just posting. And it's still in the golf business and it really interested me and I was ready to move all my classes next semester, quit the golf team. And I was ready to be a full-time employee. But then I realized like, that's not at all what I want to do. That's a part of what I want to do, 
but that's not what I want my entire job to be. And I was like, I don't want to be miserable nine to five, my first real job at a college. Um, so I said, no, <laughs> the money part hurts, but I'm sure, you know, it's all part of a bigger plan. It is. And the truth of the matter is, is with a degree and contacts, you can always find a full-time job if you need money. Exactly. But if you could do it, do it on your own. That's, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, so what, what was the, the hardest part of that freshman year, that, that transition to Hofstra? What would you say it was? Well, I'm not really friends with her anymore, but I had a really interesting roommate. Uh, she was on the team and which posed like, I don't ha- have problems with any of my friends. We all get along. There's no fights. Mm-hmm. Like I live with four girls and there has been absolutely zero issues. Mm-hmm. I find myself pretty easy to get along with um, her. We got along, but there was a little bit of promiscuity, I guess we'll call it. And um, which posed a lot of, questions and a lot of butting heads on like morals and the team didn't know why I was acting the way I was acting because I wasn't trying to expose her life um which made some of the team not like me so that was a pretty hard first semester she ended up quitting the school and she's transferred like four times now to different schools but it was it kind of made me feel crazy because for the first time in my life like I had people not like me um And they didn't know why. And I wasn't ready to, you know, tell about somebody else's personal life. Um, But now we're all good. I'm best friends with everybody on my team. I'm the team captain. And everyone knows the story very well now (laughs) because it it told itself. Um, And, yeah, that was a pretty hard couple of months, too. That definitely was the biggest challenge. But at 18, 19 years old, it takes some pretty strong principles to sacrifice your well-being to keep the confidence of somebody that you weren't getting along with. I mean, if you think about that, right, it would have been a lot easier to just be like, no, point the finger at her and be like, it's her fault, but you didn't do that. Yeah. And I think that kind of speaks to your your character, which that probably is why you're at where you're at right now. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, that was um, that was a very interesting situation. But I mean, I'm ha- it unfolded the way it was supposed to unfold, mm-hmm. you know, and that if that was the biggest part of problem of my college career that's nothing so (laughs) well that's a great way to look at it you're right it's you know how many kids go through that you know that they have a bad roommate and you know it's like it ruins a semester or a year and then you just go find another roommate you move on you know it's it's like life you're going to work with people that you don't like and you're going to you're going to live with people you don't like and you're going to maybe marry people (laughs) Don't like, trust me, I've done that too. Uh, but but it, it's it's life, yeah. right? And so if that was the hardest part, it sounds like really after that first semester, things were pre- have been pretty smooth for you. The internship at the Golf Channel, is it fair to say that sort of was like a turning point for you to be like, okay, like now I know what I want to do and here's my plan going forward about what I want my career to look like? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my biggest fear in life well, one of them is living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I know what it's like to struggle and I never want to be in that position ever. So that's kind of been the fire or the fuel to my fire throughout my mm-hmm. high school or college career, my high school and college, mm-hmm. honestly, um, because I want to get out of college being at a level that is an intro. Um, I did not spend four years of my life doing all these internships to not be ahead of the game. Um, you know, college has, and school has always come very easy to me. I'm very blessed. I put in the work and it comes my way normally. That's typically how it goes though. You study and you don't go partying every night. Grades will come your way. <laughs> That's just how it goes. I I think school is like not always a lot of how smart you are. It's really just how much like effort you put in um some subjects don't get me wrong it does take a level of intelligence but if you're failing like english and just basic classes like that that's that doesn't come from your intelligence it comes from you're being lazy uh in my opinion so school has always come easy which has allowed me to multitask like a crazy person so my days typically start pretty early around 5 30 a.m and wrap up around 10 or 11 just to get in my workouts, go to school. Um, 
I have like three jobs right now <laughs> and uh, be an athlete on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that I learned, you know, early on was how to study, mm -hmm. how to study efficiently and well so that you're not using up too much time. Right. And I think that that's also sounds like something you're really good at is being efficient with your time. Right. Like, Hey, I can do all these things in a day if I do the right things yeah. and I don't waste away time. And that's really important, you know, in terms of being accomplished and being able to move forward. I think the other thing I would say from personal experiences is like grades are great. And I had good grades in college and I have two master's degrees, but at the end of the day, you could have none of those things and still make a career mm -hmm. by being an entrepreneur right? By oh, yeah. putting your smarts to use and taking risks, which is exactly, you know, what you're doing now. So why don't, why don't you talk about, cause you have so many projects that you do, right? We haven't even gotten into the podcast. We haven't gotten into any, the stuff that you're doing in detail. So like, what are you working on now? You know, eight months before you graduate from college? Well, one, I'm trying to stack as much money as possible so I can buy some real estate and rent that out to people. That is such a big interest of mine. Um, as Airbnb arbitrage and like getting, you know, secondary income like that. But anywho, besides that, uh, <laughs> so currently right now, um, I hired an agent about a month ago and we are working very closely on more building my Twitter presence because I don't really get Twitter or use Twitter. Um, I'm not really a fan, but I guess I'm going to have to be. So we're really working hard. Um, <laughs> and my Instagram has grown really organically. Um, I have not tried to gain followers. I have not done any weird follow and unfollow hashtag. I what's come has come and it's been awesome this last year. Um, so right now I'm trying to work with her on how to build my brand a little bit more and get some bigger broadcast and media deals. I love playing golf for entertainment, right? I mean, golf in competition is a little stressful just with everything because I'm not really just focused on golf. I'm still thinking about work. I'm still thinking about school. I'm still thinking about the eight other things I have to do that day. And I can't really just dial it into golf. But when I play for entertainment and I'm really not, don't have that pressure of like what my score is, I absolutely love it. And if I could double dip that as being work, it's even better. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's what I'm trying to do right now. Um, I am with Golf Week USA Today mostly at the moment. I write a couple articles a week. I do some video stuff, content creation, and we're working on some ideas for this winter on um, some on-course stuff with them and maybe some in-studio videos coming. So lots with them. And then stuff, I just get emails for stuff that's just like, when you think there's a lull, something else pops up. And you're at a point now where like, you're going to be out of college in you know, less than a year, it's the sky's the limit. And then, you know, all of the, and some, you said something before that I, that really resonates with me where you said like, where you think there's a lull, something starts to pop back up. And as somebody who's been building a business for a couple of years now, it's starting to get to that point where you're seeding everything, mm -hmm. right? You're seeding, you're seeding, you're sending out emails. No one replies. No one replies. You make phone calls, you do this, you post on social media, nothing happens for a long time. And then all of a sudden, emails start popping up and people start reaching out and say, Oh, I listened to your podcast or I saw your website and Oh, and then before you know it, you've got more than you can handle. And then you get to call the shots. That's been my year in a nutshell. Go. Thank you for just perfectly explaining that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, it's funny because it's like, you know, I think we were talking before we started recording of, you know, this idea that, you know, when people see, when you, when you make it, make it big, right. Where you get noticed and you become more of a, celebrity or you become a, a figure in the public, people are just like, oh, where did she come from? Where did he come from? They don't know what you've been doing behind the scenes for the last four years, you know, and beyond that, breaking your butt, like spending all this time doing the right things so that you get to the point where you can reap the benefits of that by investing all that time and energy. And mm -hmm. that can be a really hard thing too, starting to deal with some of that because I've even started to get some hate and I, you know, I'm no, nowhere near follow you. Like I got my first troll and I was like, holy crap, like this is what it's like. Imagine if you got like a hundred of these a day and people are trolling you. I'm like, I don't know if I can, <laughs> I don't know if I can handle it emotionally. I've, I'll be honest, <laughs> knock on wood. I have never received a rude DM or message on social media. Now, maybe not to me or my face, but I'm sure it's been said behind my back. Yeah. But I think that's, you know, like something I you don't hear very often, especially as a female. 
Um, no, I, I don't know. It's just kind of blown me away because I thought yeah. by now it's been like, oh, your golf swing sucks or like that picture was ugly or I don't care. Like I honestly haven't had any of that. Yep. I, I think it also speaks to the to, to your following, right? In terms of the types of people who gravitate to you, mm-hmm. and you know what you're doing. Like you have a set of guardrails. This is where I want to be. I'm talking about golf. Like it's really hard to get on somebody for doing good work and doing good things and entertaining. And I think the way you handle yourself, which is very business like. Mm-hmm doesn't leave you open as much to somebody who's just sort of trying to game the system, right? Like you're actually putting out valuable content versus yeah. like, I'm just trying to get noticed here by posting a pic and, you know, a, a million people follow me. Like, and what did I do? Well, nothing really other than show myself off. Well, that's a big issue that I've had mentally. Um, I mean, growing up in Southern California, I grew up in a bathing suit. Being in a bathing suit is not foreign to me. Now I get to the mm-hmm. East coast and apparently that's promiscuous. So, um, that's been something like posting a picture in a bikini in my hometown friends. That's something not weird. That is so normal. That's not seen as like in any mm-hmm. which way, but different parts of the country and different parts of the world. It very much is. So that's been something like I went to Greece in August and I was very fortunate to get some time off to do that. And I posted a picture in a bikini and like, I was scared to do that for the first time, just because I don't want my brand to be reflected in that way. I want to be seen as a professional. Now, if I wanted to gain a million followers, I could swing a golf club in a bikini on a beach in Greece and like be done. I don't want that. I don't want to be hired from that. I don't want to see, be seen as the dumb blonde. Um, I want to be seen as the business person, um, the entrepreneur, someone who brings good ideas to the table. And I'm not just there because of my appearance. Um, so that's been something very interesting just because I was brought up in a very different community, um, and learning different people's viewpoints and stuff. So yes, I'm careful. Um, and I try to be careful, but sometimes I still am fearful that I do push the limits. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a shame that it has to be that way, but I think it does speak to different cultures and different places. And then I think ultimately too, it's just, we're living in it, things are changing in the world. And so ultimately whatever we post, whether it's a picture of ourselves, whether it's a blog post, a video, like we need to be prepared for criticism in that if we believe in and stand behind what we, you know, stand behind what we're about, then you just, you kind of just say, Hey, I know what I'm about. Like they can come at me yeah, and that's, that's but that's hard. That's not, it's not easy. <laughs> you know, it's a hard thing to do. You know, it's like the first time I got this person trolling me, I thought I was, I wrote an article about how parents should talk to their kids. And I'm like, who can criticize that? Right. And it was like, well, you're, you're teaching, and this is a quote from somebody you're teaching our kids to be pansies. And I was like, I'm not teaching them to be, I'm not teaching you to do anything. You could do whatever you want. Like, but there's research to support what I'm saying. And yeah. it's not, I'm not like taking a controversial position here. And I was like, I was like hurt by it. I was like, what's this? This is crazy. And then I realized like, this is just the way the world is. Like if they don't, people don't like the, what you're saying and it offends their way of thinking, they're going to come at you because that's the only way they, they know how to make themselves feel better. Cool. And so you just got to roll with it. I mean, you just have to go into everything, whether they say it to your face or not, you will get criticized for every single thing you do. Whether you just put your pinky out drinking that cup of coffee, whether you, what you wore outside, if you wore the wrong color sweater, I don't care from the dumbest things to the most extreme, you will get criticized for everything. Now you have people who will one, keep their mouth shut or two, say something because it truly makes them feel better. Um, You know, putting somebody else's insecurities you know, at the forefront, maybe Mm -hmm. makes them sleep better at night. I'm not one of those people. I'd rather say nothing. Um, But there is those people out there. Um, So maybe raising hell comes from a stem of compliments, honestly. Um, So that troll person could have really liked your content and could have been kind of pissed that maybe he isn't raising his kid the most optimal way. And maybe that came from a sense of, oh, no. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. So, I mean, there's just different ways to look at things and everyone thinks so different. Yeah. And, and, and if you take it back to athletics, right, it's, it's what we can and can't control. And what we can't control is what going what goes on around us, right? Like if I'm doing all the right things and I'm not getting the results right now, it's only a matter of time. If somebody doesn't like the way I'm doing something, performing, playing, like I, part of being mentally tough, part of being a mentally strong athlete is to say, I know that I'm on the right course and that I'm not going to judge myself by results, nor am I going to judge myself 
you know, as to what other people are saying. And think about it. And you know this better than anyone as an athlete and an entertainer and a journalist. Like you're taking risks every day, emotional risks about putting yourself out of the line, giving people the opportunity to judge you, right? And those people are the ones not willing to take those risks. And it makes them uncomfortable because they're not able to be in the position you are because you were the one who put your neck on the line. I'll give you an example. Um, Back around this time last year, um, I was approached by Holy Moly on ABC. And I ended up competing on the show. But I was so fearful because a lot of contestants on that show are made out to be plain idiots. Um, And I told them repeatedly, one after another, I do not want to be on the show if you're going to portray me as the dumb blonde golfer. Don't want it. Don't want any part of it. Don't want you. Don't know what angle you're going to take it because you don't know. What happens in production and post-production is completely different than how the story is actually Mm -hmm. told. Like, for instance, half the shots you saw in that game show didn't unfold like that. Fun fact. Um, <laughs> they clip, they're clipping it? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but it's just interesting how, yeah. you know, and you, that's something you like when you take these risks, you have to be very careful because everything you do right now is truly forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny you say that. So I was part of a documentary very recently within the last three months. I, I was interviewed for it. It was on CNBC and, uh, um, I did like a day worth of shooting with a colleague and, and, um, it came out like a few weeks ago and I knew, like, I was worried. I was like, okay, like, how are they going to spin this information? Now it turns out I was in it for about two seconds and it wasn't about me at all. There was all this other content, you know, that they shot. And I was like, at the very end, I was like on camera for like two seconds. Mm-hmm. So it didn't affect me. Right. But I'm thinking to myself, like, how could they spin what I'm saying to be something like, oh, this guy's you know, this and get a criticism. So I I know exactly what you're saying, you know, but I was like, I'm going to do this because it's important to me. And you know what, I'm going to say what I believe and whatever they do with it and however they spin, it's not up to me. And as long as I know what I stand for and what's happening, Mm -hmm. then, you know, I'll I'll be able to to get through it and move forward versus like, I'm going to be too scared to try something. And then what, Yeah. then I'm just going to regret that I never did it. And that's, what's the point of that? Yeah. No, I, I truly yeah. agree. That's all. So just a couple more questions because I know it's late and you're burning it on both ends. So five years from now, I've never asked this question before, but I'm going to ask you because of all the things that you've done and accomplished so far. Five years from now, where do you see yourself? I see myself having some kind of morning show or day show or night show about golf. All right. <laughs> That's pretty simple. There you go. Some Sometime in the 24 hours of the day, there's a show about golf that you're hosting. <laughs> All right. You there. there you go. Hopefully not in the morning though, because that was really early work. Yeah, <laughs> I know. You got to get getting up in the morning for TV. That's no joke. I like getting um, up early, but, yeah, but not that early. Well, That's different. That's not right. Um, last question. Yeah. So if you had to give one piece of advice to a student athlete, in high school, college, whatever, like what's the one thing you would say to them right now that you think would help them the most? If your coach just says that you do not have time for an internship or job, debate quitting that team. If you don't plan on going pro or you have no desire to go pro, realize how your career needs to align. And if you're missing out on opportunities for athletic experiences, there's a time and a place for everything. But you want your coach and a big part of the recruiting ask these questions. Will I be allowed to work my junior year? Will I be allowed to do an internship if it comes up and I need one to graduate? Because a lot of majors, you need one to graduate. Um, Ask these questions during the recruiting process because I hear from a lot of people that their coach will not let them have a job, even in the offseason, which – that's big. I mean, if you have aspirations of working at, and let's say you're in finance, JP Morgan or Citibank or some really big place, you can't show up with an empty resume. Um, so I would say that's my biggest piece of advice. It's great advice. And I think it's the first time I've heard it here on the podcast. And I think it's good advice for kids. There you go. (laughs) I mean, you're, you're, you're blazing trails here, but listen, I'm so grateful that you came on. You're super interesting. You know, when I reached out to you, you know, the first time, like it's because I've sort of followed you from afar and I've seen all the moves you made. And I think it's just 
super admirable that you've been able to do all these things in such a short amount of time with somebody who clearly has a laser focus about what they want their career to look like beyond golf and beyond sports, beyond college. So it's, it's amazing. And I'm sure you're going to get whatever you want because you're pretty persistent. And uh, I'm looking forward to watching that show one day. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Great Come time. back anytime. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Avery. So, what was your biggest takeaway from my conversation with Avery Dobsek? For me, it was that college athletics is a laboratory for building a career after sport. Avery has taken advantage of all of the resources at her disposal in college. Perhaps even more impressively, Avery created new opportunities for herself that will shape her very bright future outside of golf. My suggestion to young athletes is to think about college as a stepping stone, not an end goal. Unfortunately, sports end for all of us at some point, and having a clear plan beyond athletics will help you successfully transition out of sport when the time comes. I want to thank Avery for her kind generosity and the wisdom she shared with the Freshman Foundation community. You can learn more about Avery on her website at dovsec.wixsite.com backslash Avery Dovsec. D-O-V-S-E-K. Or check out any of her awesome content at linktr.ee backslash Avery underscore Dovsek. You can learn more about the Freshman Foundation on our website at freshmanfoundation.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you back soon for episode 25. Mike Huber is the founder and owner of Follow the Ball Coaching, located in Fairhaven, New Jersey. He is a mental performance coach and business advisor dedicated to serving athletes just like you reach their full potential on and off the court. The Freshman Foundation is all about helping you get to the next level. For more information, follow along on Instagram at the Freshman Foundation. Please subscribe. Give us a like on iTunes, Spotify, leave a review, tell a friend. Most importantly, come back in two weeks, ready to get better.